Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we welcome Chris Quilty, partner in Quilty Analytics. Cooperation between the private sector and the government has expanded in recent years, especially in areas such as satellite launch, Earth observation, and RF monitoring. But recent announcements about direct satellite to cell phone connectivity looks to put that cooperation into high gear. To discuss the broader financial, technical, and regulatory implications of direct satellite to cell phone connectivity, we are joined by Chris Quilty, partner in Quilty Analytics, an integrated strategic and financial services boutique focused on the satellite and space industry. This is Chris's second visit to Constellations. Welcome back, Chris. Thanks for having me. So, Chris, how long did it take you to recover from the first interview we had? Uh, I am still recovering, but still I'm ready recovery. to give it another try. <laughs> Aspirin every morning and try to forget everything about that interview. Good. <laughs> we know, Chris, uh, SpaceX and T-Mobile, Global Star and Apple, Iridium, along with startups AST, Space Mobile, and Link Global have all announced plans to develop constellations that connect directly to unmodified cell phones. Could this be a game changer for both industries? Well, yeah, I think it actually could be. Um, you know, one of the the curses of the space industry is that it has always been a low volume industry. Uh, if you look at traditional SATCOM deals, you know, winning a, a couple hundred gas stations uh, with a VSAT solution was considered a press releasable event. Um, you know, these are good satellite implementations, but they're just not scalable. And that's been one of the big challenges. You know, even if you look at uh, exciting markets like in-flight connectivity, you know, maybe it's going to add a billion dollars of revenue in the next five or 10 years. When you look at where could the industry, you know, scale to the types of volumes and units, uh, the consumer broadband was one of the markets that uh, the industry thought. Uh, it didn't happen in the first go around with Biosat and SpaceX, but you're seeing uh, certainly SpaceX make a run at it with a consumer model. But this is an area in the direct to device that is by its very nature, a scale business. And so if the industry can figure a way to tap into the billions of handset users out there uh, that have smartphones in their hands and make even a little bit of money off those customers, it's big news for the space industry. You know, that low volume phrase really resonates with me. I had a friend who worked in the technical area for British Petroleum. And when they would get a few, ga- this was a big deal. This was like Friday night happy hour to have a, a bunch of gas stations connected. And uh, it really has changed drastically over the years. It's gone so much, even the last few years since we've been doing this podcast has changed so much. So the inclusion of satellite in a 3GPP scope, which I guess is the defining standard for 5G, has been touted as the primary catalyst for this market. So explain to our listeners what all this means. Well, I think from a big picture perspective, what you have to understand is that the space industry is a forest of stovepipes. In other words, yes, there are standards that exist like the the DVB S2 or S2X standards that a lot of the the VSAT modem providers use. But the reality is uh, you, you just can't take a network from one provider and easily connect it together with another hardware provider because there's just so many unique and proprietary extensions and capabilities that have been layered on these standards. So uh, this has been another reason the space industry has had uh, challenges growing is because customers are sort of locked into these, these vendor relationships. One of the things that these new 3GPP standards uh, you know, hold out as a promise is the ability to see much more standardization in the industry. Standardization, as we know, it's, it's good and it's bad. If you have a nice little proprietary monopoly, uh, it may not last forever. But on the flip side, um, there's two good things about the move to the standard. One is um, it gives the satellite and industry, again, a way to tap into the much larger trillion dollar telecom industry, you know, whether it's through cellular backhaul or low latency uh, transport over a LEO network. Um, the, the, the fact that the standards exist 
now give reason for the the MNOs and other telecoms to actually give a crap about space and how they're going to integrate space into their environment. The other thing that it will almost inevitably do is if you are trying to stay 3GPP compliant and you want to play with the big boys, what it means is it's going to really diminish the ability of companies to add those proprietary hooks to remain uh you know, their own little stovepipe. So I think what we're going to see happen over the course of the next five or 10 years is lots of stovepipes coming down. Well, I'm glad you brought up the topic of MNO. I think that's a, a mobile network operator. I, do I, I guess if I had a whiteboard here, I'd make a couple big circles and I'd say, um, and so there's one business model using a mobile network operator, MNO's existing spectrum, like Starlink or T-Mobile, or something spectrum assigned to mobile satellite services. Are, are these the the approaches and their positives and negatives, each one of these approaches? Yeah. So a good place to start with this directed device market is to understand we're talking about spectrum. Now, look, if, if you want to build a imaging satellite, just about anybody can acquire a camera mounted into a, uh, uh, into a bus and yeah, you can get a NOAA license and boom, you're in the satellite imagery business. Directed device or anything in communications is different because the discussion starts and ends with spectrum, right? If you're talking about something other than spectrum, if you're talking about the bus design or how many satellites, you're talking about the wrong thing. Now, to your point, there are two very discrete approaches that companies are taking with the spectrum. In the one camp, uh, sort of the high profile announcements by companies like uh, AST Space Mobile, uh, Link, uh, you know, these efforts, uh, and, I, and I forgot <laughs> SpaceX and T-Mobile, you know, these efforts are saying, well, look, hey, we as the satellite operator, yeah, we, we, we really don't own any spectrum, but we don't need it because we're just going to use the existing terrestrial MNOs spectrum. Um, that's great. Somebody owns spectrum. Uh, that spectrum is already incorporated into the handset. You know, like there's not much to do here, except for the fact that that spectrum was never intended to be transmitted from space. So this is the fundamental challenge is companies like SpaceX, T-Mobile, AT&T, AST need to convince the regulators, that being the FCC, that yeah, it's okay to transmit this stuff from space in a coordinated fashion that isn't going to cause interference. Um, that is a, a technical uh, as well as a regulatory issue that these companies have to deal with. So that's one approach. And the great part about that approach is for somebody like AST or Link or SpaceX, they don't have to have spectrum. It's somebody else's spectrum. And the second thing is the device needs no modification. The device is the device is the device. Now, the problem is you've got to somehow figure out how to connect to it from space. Now let's flip over. There's another camp, right? which is the traditional MSS companies, a uh, term that's sort of fallen out of favor in the industry in years, but the mobile satellite services, these were spectrum bands that were freed up in the 1990s and grabbed by companies like Global Star and Iridium, uh, which own chunks of the S and L band spectrum respectively. Uh, they have deployed MSS services, uh, again, as defined by you know, those, those 1990s auctions, and they've got deployments in you know, hundreds of countries around the world. Now, that's great because it means they don't need an FCC approval to do it anything, right? They're already approved to transmit in these spectrums. The problem is that those spectrums are not intrinsic to the smartphones that are deployed. You know, your Google and uh, your Android and, and Apple iPhones, they don't have an Iridium compatible chip or a Globe, Global Star compatible chip. They don't have antennas that have been modified to work with the satellites. So therein the challenge is how do you get, you know, this hardware uh, upgrade forklift done to the mobile market? And I think what we've seen with, uh, certainly Apple is, they're starting to do that in the background, working with Qualcomm on the chip side and, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, Apple itself in, in their Foxconn factories doing some modifications to antennas to improve. So there's advantages to disadvantages of both models. And I think there's probably room for success for both models. You know, Chris, when I read about companies like Lynx, uh, the word that pops up is coverage in remote areas. And that's great. You know, rural Canada, rural Africa, that's great. But, you know, um, with my little bit of business knowledge, I don't know if there's can be very profitable. So I'm asking you to put on your CFO hat 
dig it out of the, the dust there and put on your chief financial officer hat. So, so how do both parties make money? I mean, where's the money in either of these perspectives? Yeah. So look, I mean, today companies in the satellite industry do provide cellular backhaul solutions and, and do it profitably. And these are in countries where, you know, the monthly ARPU is $3 a month, right? Not, not as attractive as, as what I'm paying on my cell bill, right? No. But uh, the point is you can drive a, a stake in the ground, put a VSAT antenna and a modem, buy capacity, distribute to a local you know, village or city and do it profitably using today's existing satellite system. Now, these systems that are being built by you know, SpaceX and AST and others are, are purpose-built systems you know, for the, this type of connectivity. And presumably, you know, the operators there have looked at the capital costs of their LEO constellations and the size of the market and feel like they can hit those price points. Now, let's flip it around. Um, you're an MNO and you've got universal service obligation requirements to deploy to these rural locations. And what we've seen is, you know, satellite uh, enabled cellular backhaul has been a big growth market. Um, in the last five to 10 years, in part because the cost of bandwidth has come down so much with high throughput satellites. And it is way, way cheaper for Vodafone to just do a 50-50 revenue share and deploy no capital, right, mm -hmm. to reach these USO individuals, you know, working with, uh, with an AST than it is for them to build out, you know, a, a, a string of, of microwave towers to try to reach these remote locations. So the point I'm making is it can be a win-win for both the MNO, this is a cheaper way to reach people, and for the satellite operator, uh, which has access to a very large install base of customers. So I, I guess this satellite device cannibal, it won't cannibalize current backhaul revenues then, huh? I mean, that's the way you presented it. It's, it, it shouldn't be a problem. Well, so I think there's there's schools of thoughts here, right? Um, is if you can just talk remotely on your iPhone anywhere, do you need an Iridium satellite phone? And the answer is, yeah, probably. We're talking about different people. You know, the folks who use those satellite phones need something that has, you know, a long battery life, maybe the fact that it, it's IP54 related and, and can work in certain weather conditions or, or, you know, a ruggedized device. So I think it's really a different market when, when you look at the sort of dedicated satellite phone user. Uh, those devices also have things like push to talk capability that are sort of unique. Um, now, is this bad news if, if you are a satellite operator and you're selling tons of capacity uh, to cellular backhaul sites? Could the fact that people now can just connect directly with their phone, uh, you know, take away from that opportunity? I think that is a possibility. But again, it will depend on the price point of those two solutions. And there may be room for both to, to survive and prosper on a go forward basis. The Constellations podcast was launched back in 2017. It was a small step for man, but a giant leap for podcasting. For the first time, you got to listen to leaders who focused on innovations in satellite and space networks. Today, thousands of people from all over the world listen to Constellations. And thanks to you, we've grown into more than just a podcast. Sign up for the Constellation newsletter to receive articles on current industry issues, podcast summaries, and contributed blog posts at constellationspodcast.com. Well, Chris, we're going to have to lighten up the discussion here. This is a part of the podcast where I quote a luminary in the satellite and space community, and you tell me who said this phrase. Are you ready for this one? Okay. All Here right. is the phrase. Disruption everywhere. <laughs> who is a luminary who said that? I think that was me. That was you, exactly. <laughs> it was kind of, whoa, here's a guy who's an analyst, been in the industry for decades, and he's, just, he's on the edge. I'm on the edge. Stop the world. I want to get off. There's so much change. It's, it's hard to keep up with all these different options, isn't it? It is. It's the reason I haven't read a book in uh, too long. <laughs> well, we have to sign some for you before the next interview, and that's for sure. So let's, uh, let's bring up a, a company you mentioned earlier, VSAT. So what about VSAT? 
Uh, as the focus to satellite to device services are focused on coverage rather than throughput, do these services pose a threat to the VSAT services then? No, I think, uh, again, like our, our prior discussion about does direct to device present a direct risk to things like satellite phones. Um, again, I think direct to device is offering something different. It's a narrow band connectivity uh, capability. Uh, whereas VSAT services often, you, you would think of these as being on an oil rig or, you know, yeah. supporting remote mining. These tend to be very high bandwidth deployment. They probably have a, an SLA or a service level agreement. Um, and, and they're very high capacity streaming video. So uh, a little bit of a different market. And, you know, I think, again, I think there is ongoing good growth in that traditional VSAT market. Well, we have to talk about, uh, bumping into each other and issues here. There have been documented spectrum issues between satellite operators and the cell phone operators. So will the merging of these services, you know, compound the issues or ameliorate them or what's going to happen with this merger? Um, well, yes and no. I, I think uh, everyone is looking out for themselves in these very unique situations. So, you know, over the past several years, there have been ongoing debates about legato and its impact on either uh, GPS devices or Iridium. And I think the, the players in that market, um, you know, irregardless of 3GPP or, or any other uh, factors, they're going to continue to duke out that battle on its merits and on, you know, the business impact that those companies are, are facing. Um, you know, more broadly, when we look at the direct-to-device market, it is interesting, you know, at first it was largely AST and uh, the MNOs they had teamed with uh, fighting against everyone else. And there's a little bit of a unique situation here. AT&T had signed an exclusive with AST in the United States. And that meant that, you know, potentially Verizon and T-Mobile were on the outside looking in. Well, now that T-Mobile has come up with its own directed device solution with SpaceX, uh, it's kind of like now it's it's Verizon on the outside looking in and arguing why this should not be done. Uh, but increasingly, you're seeing a lot more carriers and MNOs that are saying, "Hey, I'm I'm along for the ride on this," and you know that that tends to tip the balance of the regulators if the preponderance of uh, MNOs are saying, "Hey, this is a good thing, and we want to use this service." Uh, you're much more likely to get a favorable outcome from the FCC and other regulators. So, Chris, uh, put your chief financial officer hat back on, a little baseball hat in the corner there. Uh, so estimates uh, of the satellite direct-to-cell phone market potential range up to $60 billion in 10-year cumulative revenues. Do these projections take into account initially direct satellite-to-device services or only deliver slow data rates and enable simple text messages and calls? So it's, it's really slow at the beginning, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And uh, look, I mean, these are really big numbers. I mean, as I started the discussion earlier on, these are not numbers that satellite operators normally deal with in the billions of potential users. So yeah. um, look, I've, I've had fundamental uh, disagreements with uh, analysts, uh, investors around how big this market potential should be or could be. Um, I personally uh, know that, you know, I travel, my, my wife was actually out with her family, or her brothers and sisters in the Grand Canyon last week, and I couldn't track her, I couldn't contact her for pretty much the entire day uh, while they were out in the parks. Um, that is a real phenomenon. Now, the, the question is, what's it worth? I mean, if my wife could have clicked a box on her bill and said, hey, for the, you know, the next 30 days, I want this service and it'll cost me 15 bucks a month, she wouldn't have thought twice about mm. you know, paying that extra 15 bucks to, to have the connectivity. Um, again, you know, there are folks that I talk with that bring up the point that you made earlier that in a lot of the countries in the world where there is no connectivity, right, you're going to be the first line of connectivity. Um, these are really uh, low GDP countries and low per capita income. And can that possibly be an attractive market? And I don't know what, what I've seen in, in years past are, you know, our junk iPhones that, you know, I just kind of throw out, 
you know, they get bought for three or five dollars in the developed world and, and people figure out how to scrabble together a buck or two a month to pay for this. And, you know, the incremental cost to the carrier and to the satellite operator of adding these new subscribers is zero. So um, my sense is, I think, you know, when we ran the numbers on, on AST and just given the fact that there are currently their MNO partners currently have a billion eight subscribers. Those are subscribers. Those are not unconnected people within their service area. That's just the subscribers. You know, if you could get uh, a couple percent of those people to pay a dollar or two a month, yeah, you get you get the billions of dollars of revenue a year. Yeah. When we talk about billions, I think of consumers, you know, billions and billions of hamburgers and billions and billions of this and all kinds of things. And, and generally speaking, with that marketing community, they have to manage customer expectations. And I, I think that's going to happen with a lot of the electric automobiles I see around have to manage the expectations there. So, so the cell phone users we're talking about here, they're accustomed to broadband speeds, video and streaming, none of which will be available for a couple of years here. So is there a risk that users might expect more than the service can initially deliver and start complaining and moaning millions of complaints? Yeah, I think you're right there. Uh, it is important to set expectations. And, and look, there's precedent for this. I mean, it was before my time, but, uh, you know, you read the stories about Iridium and their service launch. And at least from the stories that I read, you know, it, it sounds like, uh, Motorola did not properly condition people that their satellite phone wouldn't work inside. Right? There was a, a lot of misperception around the product's features. And so, um, look, I, I, I think this is a great service. I, I can't wait until it's available where, you know, just with my phone, uh, I can connect everywhere. Um, but that you have to communicate to people that you're not going to be able to stream Netflix. You shouldn't expect to, yeah. um, you know, being able to do basic connectivity, uh, you know, hopefully something better than what, what Apple and global star, uh, you know, uh, laid out as a, as a service. I mean, that, that is the absolute bare minimum. Um, I don't think uh, SpaceX or AST need to get to 5g speeds for this to be a successful product. Um, basic texting, the ability to do a phone call, you know, if I can't do, uh, you know, streaming video, well, look, we're, we're all conditioned that these things don't work as advertised. If we look at the satellite to phone service, it's going to enable satellite operators to reach millions of new subscribers and the cost will be lowered by eliminating the deem for receiving equipment. So are the satellite operators going to be the big winners in, in this current world series? Uh, well, certainly an operator, whether it's a, a SpaceX or an AST or a Link or whoever, uh, could be Global Star, could be Iridium, that, you know, finds a new, what is really a, an entirely new revenue source. This market does not exist today. Um, you know, if you can tap into that and it turns out to be an exceptionally large uh, incremental new opportunity, then yeah, I mean, there, there is a pot of gold uh, to be had here. Um, but, you know, to your point, we don't know which of these services are going to be successful. There may be some that don't work or don't work well. Um, and we don't know what the adoption rates will look like. I feel somewhat optimistic that um, as described, you know, you do nothing to your phone, uh, a message pops up and says, hey, will you pay five bucks for, you know, your phone to work off the grid today? Um, I tend to think people will use that service and I think it'll be successful. You just said that a lot of these markets don't exist today. So uh, we know the market's in its infancy. Uh, and, and we got to look at three things. We have to look at technical, regulatory and financial challenges ahead. So which of those do you see as the biggest hurdle that they have to overcome? Oh my God, they're all hurdles, um, <laughs> and and no, none of them worth dismissing out of hand. Um, you know, the the financial one is, let's say, more challenging, just given the market environment. You know, with equities down for the year, with uh, venture capital fundraising down for the year, with private activity, private equity market activity slowing. But you know, for for good ideas, um, I, I good ideas get funded. So. Um, I, I'll say that that's maybe the, the one that I think is, is most able to be overcome here in the next uh, six to 12 months. 
the regulatory stuff is binary. And I hate to say it, but there is always some element of politics uh, that can overrule the sensible. Um, I tend to think, again, because of the compelling nature of these services, um, you know, I think the regulators will play nice because they want to see more people connected. Uh, doesn't absolve them of the responsibility of making sure that these services don't cause massive interference. Um, but, you know, I think the regulatory issues are, uh, are again, probably solvable here within the next year. Well, that's, that's pretty optimistic. You know, Chris, I think you've given our listeners uh, a real good reality check on some of this newer technology that we talked about. I'd like to thank our guest, Chris Quilty, partner in Quilty Analytics. Thank you, Chris. Well, thanks. I had fun again, and uh, I'll get over my anxiety much quicker after this one. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review.